Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, if you've just hopped on, I was just introducing Sam Brennan from Uberflip. Sam is the Director of Customer Success at Uberflip, the world's fastest growing content marketing platform. Today, he's going to share with us his experience of using customer success and leveraging marketing automation to both manage his customer and manage uh, the growth of his customer success team. So I'm going to turn this over to Sam, but before I do, I just want to re-mention that we're going to be tweeting live today. So if you'd like to follow along, we'll be using the hashtag practical customer success. So thanks very much, Sam Brennan, for being with us today. And I'm turning it over to you. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Jody. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to be today. 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 So I'm going to you guys. I think I might have to mute myself there. There we go. Got the echo out of there. Uh, but as I mentioned, I'm really excited to be here and talking with you guys today. Uh, customer success at Uberflip has been kind of a wild ride over the past 18 months or so since we've really doubled down and started to invest. Um, so hopefully, as I kind of talk to you guys a little bit today about how we've managed to scale customer success in such a unique and fast-growing environment, you guys can all learn a few things and, and, uh, and let's just kick things off. So I guess a little bit about myself and our team before we get to far into things. Uh, as Jody mentioned, I am the Director of Customer Success. We are a team of six, soon to be seven, um, that are, are really just laser focused at making sure our customers are successful, as you might expect. So that means a heavy focus on onboarding, a heavy focus on training, ongoing engagement, regular check-ins. But ultimately, our North Star is churn. So we want to make sure that our customers never have a reason to churn, and we do that by making sure they get out of the platform what they expected. So they're getting that ROI for what they pay for. So as Jerry mentioned, a little housekeeping before we get started, just to, uh, to reiterate, we always love to see some engagement on Twitter. Using hashtag practical customer success, you can kind of join the conversation, throw up some questions if you're more comfortable doing it on Twitter, that's great. We'll definitely send over slides and the recording after the fact, so you don't need to worry about taking too detailed notes because everything will be in the presentation. And then, uh, of course, we have a Q&A at the end. So I always love q and A. If you have any specific questions about how we use our customer success tools, even just about Uberflip in general, just, just let me know. If we run out of time, you can always reach us uh, on Twitter or through email. So first and foremost, a question I get a lot, and I thought I would get this out of the way right off the bat, is that Uberflip sounds a lot like Uber. And we get that question all the time. I know the guys on our support desk love it because we'll actually have people phoning us and asking us where their taxis are. And as you might expect, we're not Uber. Instead, we are your content marketing system. So some of the world's biggest brands have started to use Uberflip to really structure their content experiences in a way that lends itself to things like higher user engagement, better lead generation, uh, and because we integrate so tightly with a number of different marketing automation platforms, we can really help to keep that beast fed and we're fueling those marketing automation systems. So there's a few of our big customers. Um, as we go today, you'll, you'll kind of learn a little bit more about our whole customer base as we've grown, but we now have uh, almost 1,700 Uber flippers, which is really exciting. So I thought what I would do today, because we are kind of a unique growth story, is kind of take you through the evolution of Uber Flip. And we started way back in 2008, and at the time, we weren't actually even called Uberflip. We were Magazine. And Uberflip, in its first iteration as a magazine tool, was essentially a platform where magazine publishers or media publishers could take their PDF documents, put them online, and turn them into something that was a heck of a lot more enticing. So rather than have a boring old PDF that's hard to deliver, really unengaging, and gives you no insights, a flipbook would let you have a really engaging experience, can add interactive elements to it. And it was ultimately just a, a really cool product that was one of the first in the market. So way back then, we were you know, a growing company, obviously, so it took us a while to hit that first 100 customer mark. And then about 2012, we pivoted a little bit. So I have a little star here. And that's really where we, we revamped our entire offering, basically. And we kind of pivoted uh, 180 degrees, and we embraced what was previously a small segment of our customer base, and we really saw that as the future where most of our growth would come from. So we invested in this full content marketing suite. And that's really what Uberflip has become today. It really is a platform for content marketers versus media publishers. 
And as you can see, since 2012, we've had a, a pretty strong growth trajectory. We got from about 225 customers when we launched Hubs to 1,700 plus today. And it's been a really wild ride. And I'll start to kind of talk to you why. Uh, and again, so our first product was Flipbooks, right? So this is just a PDF solution tool that was great for media publishers. And what we found is we had customer segment number one. So from about 2008 to 2010, these were our, our first users. These were our early adopters, people who were looking for just a, a PDF solution. They had a light single product usage as far as their behavior goes. Everything was basically month-to-month -month payment back then. Um, it was extremely low dollar value where people would pay us you know, from like 20 to 30 bucks a month on the high end to upload a few documents a month. It didn't really require a whole lot of hand-holding from a customer success perspective. They were kind of just doing it all themselves. Um, and as we grew, what we noticed is a new segment started to take hold as people became more advanced with our product. So this is where we had kind of version two of our flipbook platform, where we started to add things to it, like really powerful insights. And we started to add things to it, like the ability to drop videos that might live on YouTube into a PDF. And what we ended up with was seeing our customer base a segment into two different parts. So we still had our, our great old uh, Flipbook customers that were media publishers. Now we started to see this new segment pop up of uh, B2B content marketers. And they actually proved to be a really strong user of the platform. Because they were taking tons and tons of the content they produce, which is overwhelmingly PDF-based, and then transforming it into you know, like an online ebook or a white paper or an infographic. So they became really heavy users. And it was still a single product, so they were these heavy single product users, but they were exploring new use cases, which was really exciting for us. Back then, we were still on a month-to-month -month payment system. So from a customer success perspective, it makes things very tricky. But these started to get more into the medium dollar value as they started to pay a little bit more to get access to more of these new features that we were building out. So then we hit about 2012. Uh, and you remember from that growth trajectory graph we looked at, that's where we pivoted and we built this new hubs platform to really revamp what we did. And what we found when we added that hubs platform to our traditional Flipbook offering was, surprise, surprise, customer segment number three sprung up. So this is now where we have multiple products, and customer segment number three was really kind of on the light side of the multi-product usage spectrum. They were using Flipbooks to create these great PDFs, or great, sorry, great eBooks and white papers, but they'd also started to use our Hubs platform to dabble in things like pulling blog posts and videos together into something that they could control as a marketer, drop onto their website. But it was just kind of early days, they weren't quite sure how to use it, and they were still exploring use cases. But again, there were new use cases for us. So as a success team, we had to adapt and start to get more hands-on. This is where we really started to go from that month-to-month, low-dollar value customer to a more annual contract. And these are customers that started to pay us a little bit more to, again, get access to this new platform we had. So the, the dollar value started to shift up, and things became a lot, uh, a lot more interesting from a customer success perspective when you start to get into how do you start to scale that. So from there, this is where we are today. We refer to ourselves as a content marketing automation solution. So essentially the high level pitch is that we allow marketers to connect all of their content, so that would be PDF, social content, blog posts, slide share presentations, and you bring it all together into this one central experience that's beautiful, optimized for mobile devices, and it includes all these great features that help you organize and make your content really easy to discover. Of course, we have built-in tools. So the big thing about being a platform is you need to integrate with just about everything. So we have built-in tools with marketing automation platforms and email marketing tools that allow us to collect and then convert and optimize those leads as we understand more about how they're consuming content inside of this Moodflip Hub. So there's a few cool examples. These are just little screenshots. Um, and if you're interested, you can pop over to our website and take a look at these in more detail. But customers like Visual and Dine and Booker have been really, really successful in creating these really cool front-end experiences that are engaging their audiences and converting more of them from visitors into leads. So that, of course, brought about customer segment number four, which is typically who we are dealing with today. All of our new customers, I would typically slot into this new segment. And 
these are really sophisticated multi-product users. So as we have scaled our platform up from a low-cost flipbook tool to a full content marketing suite platform, we started to see the more sophisticated marketers get involved. And these are people that are, are quite demanding because they have high expectations and they're held to a very high standard. So they're exploring tons of new use cases on their site, typically revamping an entire resources center with a big project. Overwhelmingly, these guys are on more annual contracts, which makes things a little bit more straightforward from a customer success perspective. And of course, when you do that, these are our more higher values. So this is where today, our average selling price for users is a lot higher than it used to be. So from a customer success perspective, we also have to loop that in as we're thinking about scaling, as we're thinking about how do we start to automate this whole process. So what you end up with as a customer success perspective, or a customer success person at Uberflux, is you're right in the middle of these four really unique customer segments. On the legacy side, so that's customer one and two, these are your flipbook users. There's about 1,300 of them today. And on the right side, we have our newer, higher dollar value users, which is customer segments three and four. And there's typically about 400 or so of these customers. So you can imagine the challenge that starts to create for us as a team of only six people is how do we deal with each one of these unique customer segments, each with very different needs, wants, and expectations, all of us paying a different amount of money. So it, it's really challenging. So when we started exploring the idea of a customer success management tool, the challenge we were facing was how do we, as a team of six, with a really, really diverse and unique customer base, work really hard to reduce churn, improve customer health, and then also manage that transition up market that we were taking as a company. So going from that low dollar value solution to a real high dollar value platform that can do everything. So it was a really tricky challenge and we approached it in a couple of unique ways. First and foremost, we needed to find a tool. So one of the, the key challenges when I had first joined Uberflow is we were a customer base of 1,600 people. And I was the only success person at the time. So I come into work every morning and sit down and think, oh my God, how the heck am I going to talk to 1,600 people this month? And it's just not scalable, as you can imagine. And even with a team of six, with a customer base of 1,700, there's no way that we can talk to everyone all the time and be on top of what they're doing inside the, the platform. And more often than not, in the early days, our, our customer success meetings were essentially, you know, let's sit down and who do we remember off the top of our heads we need to talk to? Maybe we have a list of our, our really high value or most important accounts, but a lot of the times things did tend to fall through the cracks, and it's, it's just a, a numbers game at that point. So when we started searching for a customer success management tool to help us scale up, we had a few important criteria that we were looking at. So some of those are just the prerequisites. So we'd done our homework and, and we'd explored all the different solutions to understand what kind of was standard with them. So that's things like relationship health scoring, uh, obviously the integrations that we would need into our marketing stack. So that would be things like HubSpot or Salesforce Service Cloud for our ticketing management system or billing platforms. We wanted to make sure that the tool we picked had all of those things available. Of course, we wanted that strong health scoring capability as well so that we'd understand where to prioritize our time with each one of these very different customer segments. We wanted the workflow management aspect. So this is one that actually is really hard to find depending on the tool you're looking for. And as I get a little bit further, you'll see what I mean by workflow management, but it's a, a really crucial piece as you start to scale up your team. Of course, we also are a small and growing company, so cost was important to us. We needed to be cost effective and be able to, to easily demonstrate that ROI to our management team in order to sell this new platform. So I'll talk about this a little bit later when I get into the whole automation piece, but for us at Uberflip, like our whole business is really built on the back of marketing automation tools. So for us, our HubSpot account is kind of like the e chain Now there's nothing more valuable at Uberflip than our HubSpot account we wouldn't be able to scale up. Our marketing team wouldn't be able to do what they do without that HubSpot account. So for us, it was, it was kind of crazy when you go look at some tools and they were just exorbitant amounts of money per month. And I could just think, now, there's no way I'm going to be able to sell that being more valuable than, than, our, marketing, or than our marketing automation tool. So cost was, was something that was important. And then last but not least, this one I can't overstress enough. One of the key things we were looking for as a growing team that was relatively new to customer success was the idea of having someone to have our backs. So we want someone with expertise in the customer success industry that's gonna be able to work with us 
to make sure that you know, we're, of course, using the tool right, but also that we're paying attention to the right things, that we are approaching customer success the way that a modern SaaS company should approach customer success. So obviously, uh, as you can probably imagine, given that our gracious hosts are hosting this webinar today, we ended up picking Amity, um, and we can talk about that a little bit later. So step two, once we had our tool in place, we really had to mature as a customer success organization. So a lot of our early day stuff was done in basic Excel documents or Word documents, or maybe we, we went and we, we got ourselves a PowerPoint presentation and we put some little bubbles and that was our flow chart. That was the kind of processes we had in place, which as you're trying to scale up and become a real customer success team for 1,700 customers, just doesn't translate very well. So we went through the processification process, if you want to call it that, where we started to pull up as much data as we could. I'm sorry, jump ahead a little bit. And we really just worked hard to understand how our customers were using our platform from each one of those different segments. So the first thing we did was we started with our onboarding program because for us, and I would imagine for most staff businesses, onboarding is kind of our silver bullet. If our onboarding process wasn't succeeding at turning our new customers into advocates within the first 100 days or so, we were ultimately just kind of setting ourselves up for failure. We were spinning our wheels, and time and time again, what we noticed is someone that was onboarded poorly would leave after about six months. So we really worked hard to document our process for onboarding, make sure that it worked, so that we can move away from a system like this, which was, we called it the Great Wall of Onboarding, but I kid you not, it was a giant wall that we would put sticky notes on. And we would say, oh, great, new customers on board today. Let's put them in the kickoff stage. And we'll move them through each and every week to different stages, all of the sticky notes. So, you know, God forbid the sticky note should lose its stickiness. That customer would kind of fall through the cracks. Or you know, maybe it was a really busy day and a new customer paid us, but we didn't get a chance to put a sticky note on the board. That customer, again, would, would kind of fall through the cracks. So obviously not a scalable process. So instead, when we have a tool like Amity or any customer success management tool in place, we can take this and translate it into something like this. So it becomes immediately available to everyone. It lives in the cloud. I can access this whether I'm on my bus ride to work or I'm at my desk or I'm taking a vacation. But ultimately what we did is because we had this process down for how we onboard our customers, we were able to start to scale it and automate it using some cool rules. So if a customer had, for example, hit certain criteria when they were in the kickoff stage, such as they touched or talked to a customer success person, they submitted a survey, and they had had the first kickoff call, we might automatically choose to move them over to a connection stage by just changing the stage of the process. So we always know where that user is, and we can always take the steps to keep them going without manually having to remember to move a sticky note. What we also did, as I mentioned, was, was dive into the data. So I worked with our marketing team, I worked with our sales team a little bit, I worked with our dev team to pull as much data as I could get around how all of our customers were using our platform. So what you see on the screen now, this is a little study I did, and I just grabbed a snapshot of it. But these were our, our kind of top customers. These are our people who use the platform the best. And we know that because they, they've either told us you know, they're really successful with their results, or maybe they had a high NPS, something like that. And we pulled out every dimension we could find. So every little piece of the platform they might be using, all the different features, things like how often they've logged into the app, or how many sessions they have, how many cases they might have submitted, how many contacts they had on the account. Everything we could get our hands on, we looked at. And what we tried to do is map out what they're most likely to do. So we found that the most common activities of successful customers were basically what we would have thought. And that's doing things that add value from the customer's perspective. So a lot of the time, I think, with customer success, you can kind of fall into this trap where you have a certain thing, set of criteria you care about, but your customers sometimes have a very different set of criteria that they're measuring the value your service delivers on. So for us, you know, our original thought was, hey, if a, if a customer is using feature A, B, and C to 90% of what they can do with it, that's great. That means they're a successful customer. Whereas that same customer might have said to us, well, now that's, that's great, maybe I will use those features, but ultimately all I want is more leads for my content, or all I want is more page views, higher time on page. So we came to this idea of tracking the successful activities inside Uberflow that led to successful outcomes for our customers. 
So some of those activities are things like editing a blog post. So it could be adding a meta description to it, make it more SEO friendly. Or maybe they go in and they've added new content, or they've edited one of their CTAs to make sure that it is converting as best as it can. Those are the kind of activities we looked at, and when we started to compare that to the baseline and then ultimately to our list of churn customers, we had a really good understanding of what kind of processes we should create to scale this up with our new tool. So what we ended up with, and this is something that I've seen a couple other customer success organizations use, is this idea of a scale along penetration and engagement. So on the penetration side, that refers to how deep people have gone with our product. And we're kind of in the unique position that because we do have two halves of the product essentially, and we can just say if, if a customer's on the low end, they're only using one and they're using it poorly. If a customer's on the high end, they're using both halves of the platform and they're using them really well. On the engagement side, this is where we would measure how engaged with the platform they are in concert with how engaged with us as a success team they are. So we came up with these four kind of quadrants. If a customer was highly engaged and had gone deep in the platform, we consider you an advocate. If you are really, really engaged, but maybe you haven't used the full breadth of the platform, then you're just a one-hit wonder. So you are one of our legacy Flipbook customers who loves everything about the platform, you just haven't embraced hubs yet. Or maybe you are a hubs user because you love the idea of centralizing your Facebook posts, your Twitter posts, and your Instagram photos, but you don't really care about Flipbook. On the left-hand side, we had our waiting believers. So these are people who signed up and they're gung-ho from day one, but then maybe two to three or four months later, you know, their, their engagement starts to fall off. So they're logging into the app less frequently. They're making less of those activities that lead to successful outcomes. And maybe it's even just there, they stop responding to our emails, they've created less cases. Bottom left, we have our risky businesses. So these are people who are doing terrible on both scales. They're not engaged with the platform at all anymore, and they're probably only using one half. So these are people that need our attention and need our attention right now. The tricky part for us is it's not quite as simple as this nice graph because we have four unique customer segments. So what we had to do was take that idea of processification and then subdivide it into four unique categories. Well, we were replicating the same process, but for each individual group of customers that, of course, had their own needs, their own problems, and their own criteria for measuring success. So what we did is we basically just matched one out for each of our four segments. And we understand, you know, if you are a legacy Flipbook customer, you know, what makes you an advocate? What makes you a one-hit wonder? And we have our own unique set of criteria and processes designed to engage and make sure each one of those segments remains happy and, and ideally we have four quadrants all in the top right. So the last step was to, to automate and, and really start to think more like marketers than customer success people. And that was really important for us because ultimately automation really is the key. If we have these great processes, it doesn't really matter if we don't have the bandwidth to follow through with them. You could have the world's nicest flow chart, but if you're a team of six trying to deal with a customer base of 1,700, bandwidth is obviously a huge, huge concern. So what we did is start to think about automation, different ways, different tools we can use to kind of automate the growth and, and make our team of six do the job of a team of 20. And to do that, we turned to the, the smartest group of people I know when it comes to automation, and that is our marketing team. So these guys have been spoiled for years and years and years now when I think about it because they have access to this wonderful tool called marketing automation. And marketing automation has really changed the way that marketers operate. And it, I mean, starting with HubSpot, obviously, they're, they're the most well-known, they've got the most number of customers, and they've really transformed just about everything that a marketer does on a day-to-day -day basis. They now allow even tiny, tiny teams to reach these huge audiences and to do it at scale. The really cool part is, with a marketing automation tool in place, even a single marketer, so just this one person in an organization, can do alone what used to take an entire team of people, and in many cases, they can also do it better. And marketers have been really quick to embrace automation, which is understandable, because according to some research I read from Pardot, 79% of top performing companies have actually been able to use marketing automation for two or more years. So there's definitely a correlation between companies that are doing well in the marketing space and the use of these tools that help to automate the 
mundane or repetitive tasks that a marketer just doesn't have time to do. So because of that, marketers are spending less time doing those tasks and instead spending more time doing the work that truly matters, which is for them creating and distributing amazing content. What we're starting to see is tools like Amity do the same thing for customer success managers. So the cool part with that and why I kind of reached out to our marketing team was they've got all this expertise and they're used to working in an environment where they're dealing with it could be one to 100,000 people. And for us, we weren't quite that drastic, but we wanted to learn from them. So what we did is ask their opinion, work with them over a couple of weeks to try and figure out how we could automate some of the same processes so that we could deal with customer base that was numbering into the thousands. And what we ended up with, with Amity's help, was connecting Amity and HubSpot, which our marketing team uses. And when we put these two tools together, we found a lot of great success, and we started to be able to do some really cool things. It really has taken off in the last five weeks or so since it's been up, and it's starting to change the way that our success team operates on a daily basis. So two key things that we kind of came to the conclusion of. One was the ability to trigger workflows inside of HubSpot based on Amity's insights it was really, really important and really, really valuable. And the other one was more, you know, our marketing team was interested in this and so was I, but how to understand how content engagement is actually impacting the health of a customer base. So from a, a success standpoint, obviously when we plug in tools like Amity or Kits Metrics into our app, things we're looking to understand is how people are using our app is influencing their health, which is really important. But as I'll talk about a little bit later, it's also important to understand how your marketing team's work is influencing those customers as well, because they're doing a great job, that will have a huge impact on the ultimate health of your customer. So first and foremost, what is an insight? Uh, and in Amity's perspective, an insight just lets us know where we need to focus our attention. So we trigger our insights in Amity on a few key things, as I mentioned. One is activity, so the things you might do in our app the other one is outcome. So that's the results that those activities are leading to. So to put this really bluntly, an activity might be you're adding a new blog post. The outcome might be you're seeing an increase in leads. Each of those tells us very important things about how our users are engaging with the app and the value they're receiving. So one example workflow that we now trigger is that if we notice that an account hasn't been engaged with for 60 days, and that could be just people who we haven't talked to as a success team, they maybe not submitted a case, maybe they've only logged in a little bit, you can now automatically drop that contact into a HubSpot workflow we create with our marketing team. And these HubSpot workflows are specially designed to re-engage users over a span of a couple of days or even a month. And the goal is to spur a conversation. So that's the really cool part about a workflow is because it is an ongoing conversation and not a one-off note, it's harder for our customers to ignore and as marketers or customer success people, we can get really creative about how we're doing it. So maybe we've noticed key things about you know, unengaged customers over 60 days, and we can send them a series of really fun and engaging emails to just get them to call us, to get them to log back into the app. The cool part is I don't actually have to lift a finger to do it. I put in the upfront investment right now to make sure that the HubSpot workflow is designed the right way but once that insight in Amity is triggered, if you know, this person hasn't been engaged with for 60 days, the HubSpot thing kicks in automatically. Since we have built that workflow, in this case you can see this is the exact screenshot from our unengaged customer's workflow, we've seen some pretty cool results. Uh, and this is a stat I pulled just yesterday to get the most up-to-date stat, but since we kind of plugged this in, we've actually seen an 84% increase in engaged accounts. And that's just like, a couple of weeks over a couple of weeks, so we're still gathering the data, but we're seeing a ton more engagement, and whether it's a customer success team reaching out or whether it's our customers actually becoming re-engaged through these workflows, like over the moon with an 84% increase in engaged accounts. On the more marketing side, so this is that second key question we were looking at, we're really hoping to understand the customer impact of the content that our team works so hard to create. So a lot of that content is created by our customer success team. So we create probably just as much, if not a little bit more content than our marketing team does. It typically gets used in the knowledge base or webinars, short videos we might produce. But our marketing team also creates a lot of great content. 
and that's things like blog posts and webinars and infographics and ebooks. And I wanted to understand how that was influencing the customer's health. So some of you might be wondering why. Now, why would I care about that? And the coolest way I can think to describe that is actually with an example from HubSpot. And there's probably a few people on the call who have heard of HubSpot's cheat or the customer happiness index. And the thing I love about the HubSpot customer chief is it's not just based on how people are using HubSpot. It's actually not even based on the outcomes that they're necessarily getting from HubSpot. Instead, like the whole goal of the Qi Index is to get people who have bought into what HubSpot is preaching as an organization. And that is ultimately the merits of inbound marketing. So the cool thing for them is that's that third dimension where they'll, of course, know how you're using HubSpot and the results you're getting from it. But if you're not practicing what they preach or drinking the HubSpot Kool-Aid, you know, you're really not going to be as successful as someone who, who is. So for us, we kind of took that same approach where we have the Uber full of Kool-Aid, man, and we want to know how people who have bought into what we preach about content marketing are impacting from a health perspective. So our, our marketing team kind of create, takes that same approach to the content they create, where you know, you're not regularly consuming marketing content about how to be a better B2B content marketer, how to get more leads from your content, how to boost engagement by designing great experiences. You're really not going to be as successful as an Uber flipper as people who are. So we plugged in all that data from HubSpot, things like how many emails you've opened, uh, how likely you are to click, things like... Uh, we know what lists or workflows you might have been a part of in the past, and we were able to find some pretty cool results from that. And let me just see if I have this slide. Um, so some of them that we found, they're just, just off the top of my head because I pulled these numbers yesterday, is we, we looked at the difference between click-through rates and email for churn customers versus our best customers. For our best customers, we saw open rates average about 90% and click-throughs about 25%. So that could be daily blog posts that our marketing team might send you, webinars, ebooks. And when we compared that to our list of customers who had churn, we saw a pretty startling difference, where a churn customer was only likely to have opened about 49% of our emails and clicked through to 10%. So you can see that delta there is it's quite significant. 90 versus 49 and 25 versus 10. Where again, we can now directly tie a link between those two numbers and say, if a customer is not engaging with our marketing team quite as much, that's a red flag. We should probably pay some closer attention to you as a customer success team. So early indications are great. Um, we know that our, our best customers are much more likely to engage with our marketing content than a churn customer, uh, as you would expect. And because of the unique nature of our product, we're, we're hopeful that that continues. And we're hopeful that other things we create as Theme can ultimately be tied into that score as well. So we'll know how much content you might be consuming in our knowledge base and how that also impacts your health as a customer. So some key takeaways from today. I hope everyone leaves the call and goes back to their desks and just focuses on segmenting, segmenting, segmenting. And it's certainly not an easy process. I can tell you it took us a while to nail it down because it is a little bit of an abstract thought. But once you have nailed it down, and it could be around the way that people use it, it could be around a specific product, and any segmentation is better than no segmentation. But once you've done it, you'll really start to be able to develop the kind of processes that allow you to scale up. Another important thing is definitely find a customer success management tool. Do it yesterday. You can never start too soon. And as I've talked to more people in the success industry, you know, it's usually one of the first questions I get is, when should I start looking at this? And I always say, you know, we waited about a year before we, we got one, and that was a year that we fell behind. So we'd always kind of known about the value of it, but we really didn't reap the benefits of it until a couple of weeks ago. It's also really important to start to build out your key processes based on those activities that lead to outcomes. So you need to then plug those into the tool you've chosen, and once you've done that, you really start to see the benefits of the automation take over. So that's automation within the tool itself, but also when you can combine two different automation tools together, like Amity and HubSpot, things really start to take off. Last point is definitely automate as much as you can. Um, and when you combine those two tools, you, know, you can really allow a, even a really tiny team, maybe it's just yourself right now doing customer success, 
but a tool like Amity with HubSpot can help you as a single person do the job of a much larger team. So with that, I'll kick things back over now to Paul. Uh, he has a couple of words to say, but I hope everyone uh, learned a little bit today. And if you have any questions, now I'm just kind of throw them in the chat window, and then we can get to them after Paul talks. Great, thanks, Sam. That was that was a great session. I have uh, pages and pages of notes. I I learned a, a ton, and I'm sure that. Um, everyone on the webinar learned a ton. Thank you very much for that great content. And uh, I'd like to take a quick moment just to introduce Amity to everybody on the call. I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes, and then we'll uh, throw this back um, to Sam to take your questions. And Sam, I really love what you said about building processes based on key activities and customer outcomes. That's really the goal of the Amity system the Amity product, and when uh, our customers build, uh, implement Amity into their processes that way, they tell us that they uh, can triple their productivity of their customer success teams. That means uh, minimizing churn, maximizing upselling and cross-selling, converting more trials, and generating more advocates and referrals for their business. And um, we help, Amity helps our customers achieve those goals, by getting rid of all of that manual activity um, that goes into customer success without an automation platform. I love the picture of your whiteboard with all the sticky notes. That's a, a great picture of all the manual work that goes into customer success without a tool. We um, help our customers eliminate surprises. It's really surprises that lead to uh, firefighting and being reactive. And um, so we help spotlight risks and opportunities early and in real time so you can get on top of it and be proactive. And uh, the, we help you improve the engagement with your customers to deliver the right action at the right time with the right amount of touch, which is really the key to the automation uh, process. And um, uh, our approach to customer success is exactly what Sam was talking about outcome-based customer success, focusing on the things that deliver results for your customers, and looking for changes in rhythms at that customer, more activity, less activity, more results, less results, more engagement, less engagement. Those are the kinds of signals that tell you it may be time to engage with that customer in a more personal, uh, helpful way. And um, so that's the, the goal of the Amity platform. We call that technology sense and respond. We're sensing uh, what's happening with your customer's activity, with the outcomes and results they're producing. And then we let you automate the response uh, to that in a way that's tailored to exactly what your business needs and exactly what that customer needs. So if you'd like to learn more about the Amity platform and uh, how it can help your customer success organization scale and be more productive, just hit one of the um, request a demo links on our website. And uh, that's it for the pitch. Back to Sam and, uh, and your questions. Awesome, awesome. So it looks like, so, a, looks like a first question, first question in there, in there was, was, let me mute myself again. There we go, sorry about that echo. Uh, first question from Barit. Yeah, he's asking how we use our customer content to impact adoption and usage, or how we track how that content impacts adoption and usage. And that's a great question. Uh, and we do that through the, the HubSpot and Amity integration. So we're able to surface insights like you know, how many emails somebody might have clicked through, uh, what their open rates look like, how many workflows or lists they were part of. Soon we'll be able to track specific conversion information as well in, in terms of uh, you know, what offers they've converted on, how many page views on the sites they've done. And because of that, we're able to track that in concert with their health score. So over time, what we've been able to do is build this correlation up where we can understand how the marketing content that our team creates is impacting that, that overall health score. But that's a great question. Uh, and there's another kind of follow-up on how we analyze which content, content drives higher adoption. So that way we do it actually again through HubSpot and Amity, but we also do that using our own platform, not to get too far into that. We have uh, an idea we call content scoring, 
where we're able to understand with one number basically how well content is engaging our customer base. That's with things like analysis of page views and clicks, uh, and social shares, things like that. So, so Cole asked uh, if you could see the two slides on customer segments. Let me jump back there. So we had, uh, I think this is the one probably after. Uh, and let me know if, if that's not right. But what we did with this is we kind of took the idea of, of this one penetration engagement scale and then just replicated it across all of the different customer segments. So we had four unique ones that we were able to identify, and this was just based on when they signed up, their expectations as a customer, their desired outcomes. They were unique enough that we could group them into unique groups, but this idea of penetration and engagement does kind of span that. So we were able to kind of to take one big idea, separate, separate it into four different chunks, but still apply the same kind of logic to each of them, and we've seen some pretty cool results from that so far. So another question from Marit on uh, whether or not we've tried in-app messaging in addition to HubSpot. Uh, and we actually do. So we use, we use Intercom as a tool for about 14 or 15 months now, and it's a fantastic little tool. Uh, we, I do approach it a little bit differently from some other teams. I know some people will just use Intercom. Intercom has a few limitations for me, which is where I really enjoy having Amity and HubSpot together. I kind of view Intercom as more that in-app messaging tool where I can engage with people contextually while they're in the application, but it's not so great for things like email. So when I can connect Amity and HubSpot and drive workflows based on insights, what I can do is, is actually engage in people with a conversation rather than just a one-off email that might get sent from Intercom that you might ignore. So you can use them both together, and that's what we're, we're continuing to do because I see them as different use cases that can both ultimately help me keep our customers out here. Uh, another one on do you use Qi separately from customer health score calculations in Amity, or do we use it as a factor to calculate overall customer health? If it's the latter, what kind of weight percentage did you give it? So the Qi thing is that it's a really interesting model. Um, and it, honestly, it's kind of hard to pin down the specifics of it. But we, we do use it to factor into our overall customer health scores. So what we would essentially do in Amity there is create an insight based on marketing engagement. Or we can say, you know, if a customer hasn't engaged with this percentage of, of emails from an open or click-through standpoint, or they're not a member of enough lists, then we'll automatically have that tie into customer health. And as far as the weighting goes, um, you know, it's, it's honestly, it's a constant thing. So we're struggling, or not struggling, I should say, we're, we're constantly evolving that. It's never going to be set in stone. Uh, we, we monitor that, and we're updating our customer health scores regularly. Right now, I would, I would give that probably less, less weight than their outcomes. That's number one. Um, less weight than their activity in the app. That's probably number two. But it is still an important element of our overall customer health scoring. So here's another one on, uh, was there anything besides product features your company did to enhance revenues to annual contracts at a higher average selling price? So yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I would say when well, we were a very product focused company for a long time, and, and we still are, where we're regularly developing awesome new things to add to the platform, existing packs, new things that we can, can add on, but I think a lot of it is also just maturity as an organization from a marketing standpoint. And a lot of that comes down to setting the right expectations with things like your content. So if, if you haven't embraced content marketing as a discipline yet, I say dive in because not only will you be able to fuel an inbound marketing engine with content, you can also use that content to set the right expectations as far as people in the sales process go. So a customer who goes to a site that's full of great content that can explain the customer's problem and different ways they can approach to solve it will ultimately create higher perception of value in their mind so that when they hit a pricing page and they, they say, oh, okay, this costs X dollars, and you're driving up that average AFP, you know, it makes a little bit more sense to the customer to say, okay, this organization looks legit. They obviously understand problems I'm facing as a business, and you know, there's all these great uh, features that are coming out anyway. So here's a question from Andrew on how do our KPIs vary from four different segments? So that's a, a great question. Uh, KPIs are a little bit different depending on what segment you're in, obviously because of the unique nature, I think, of how we built them. So ultimately, 
if you're looking at segments like three and four, you, know, you have very similar goals. You just have different expectations. So you're using our hubs platform to centralize your content. You're using it to engage more customers and drive more leads. So you're probably more focused on outcomes like number of leads you're generating per month, the increases in page views. You're probably going to focus more on kind of the time savings that you are enjoying as a marketer. So those are the things that we would look at as far as KPIs, like what their outcomes are. And we have been able to tie product usage to that as well. So things like the number of particular features you're using. Um, there's a, a three or four of them that we look at that can really influence whether or not a customer is getting the right outcomes. And on the left side, we have our more flipbook users. So these are completely different use cases. So they don't care about centralizing content. They don't care about generating more leads necessarily from their content. All they're after is creating these amazing flipbook experiences that they can plop onto their website and drive up page views. They want to be able to see the insights that they can get from that platform. So we focus a lot on, on the metrics, whether people are accessing those pages or not. We focus a lot on your frequency of uploading, uh, as well as the frequency with which you upload a, a document and then go and take some type of next step with it. Here's a question from Brandon uh, on whether or not we integrate your NPS survey into the product and what our typical NPS survey response rates are. So this one is actually something we're working on right now and we've tried to use Intercom to do this in the past uh, and you know that is to a degree I guess integrated into the product but again one of the limitations of Intercom is it really isn't built for NPS just yet. So historically we haven't really had fantastic NPS results. Um, as far as response rates go, um, but it is something we're working to, to do now of with our email marketing team. So we're going to try and get uh, more upfront with that, find unique and creative tools maybe. So I know there are a number of NPS specific tools you can actually integrate into your website as a whole. Uh, and it's something we're going to look at because ultimately NPS is a fantastic way to find the segment of customers that considers themselves to be successful, which is ultimately what you're after. So there's a, another question from Marie who says, what's the most value you receive from Amity outside of the integration with HubSpot? So that one kind of goes back right, let me jump back here. That goes down right here. And it's something so basic, but again, that onboarding process before, like it, it worked well enough, uh, but it was incredibly low tech and it was at the mercy of the adhesives on the back of our sticky notes. So if something fell off the wall, we were, shot until someone could remember to put something back up. So the workflow management piece for us has been huge. Um, and before we'd even really integrated Amity into our entire marketing stack, we were using it for the workflow piece just because it allowed us to track our, our onboarding programs or how we were taking an unhealthy customer and making them healthier all in one system that everyone had access to as an organization. So you can think about that in the context of a, a weekly meeting you might have with your team. Before, what we would have to do is maybe pull up Salesforce, run a, a little report to find all of someone's customers, and then we just run through a list and say, how are they doing, how are they doing, how are they doing? What we're doing now is pulling up Amity, and we can automatically see their customers and where they are in the onboarding progress or process. We can identify people who have been in a particular stage for too long and start to work to get them out of that stage. We can see all at-risk customers and see the kind of steps that we're proactively taking to make them healthier again. So even from a workflow perspective, like we, we've seen the value of Amity from day one. Looks like a uh, final question here is from Lonnie. Asked, how do we measure your churn? So that's a great question. And it's evolved over the years, actually. So when I first came on board, most of our customers were, were pretty low average selling price, and they're all pretty much in the same ballpark. So it made more sense for us to, to focus on number churn. So that is the percentage of the customers who leave us every month because everyone was basically the same. And, and we tracked that for a long time until we started to scale up market more and get more involved with higher dollar customers where it no longer made sense to, to track the number of customers because you might have 100 customers leave you in one month and that represents 1% of your revenue or you could have one giant customer leave you that represents 10% of your revenue. So you want to focus the efforts of the team around the right metrics. And for us, that is now dollar revenue so that we're focused on retaining the, the accounts that obviously are, are the highest dollar value to us. So 
we measure our churn um, based on, on the dollar value per month. Uh, the last couple of weeks that we've, or sorry, last couple of months, uh, since we've really changed over to that, that model, um, and we've noticed a, a great improvement in terms of, of what we're doing. So I think we have a few minutes left. So if there are any questions, um, let's just post them in, in this question window, or if you want to reach out to us afterwards, go ahead and do that as well. So I think I'm actually going to kick things back to Jody now, just to, to kind of wrap things up. Sam, thanks so much. Uh, really an amazing presentation. If anybody has tips for practical customer success, it's definitely you. Uh, loved what we learned about you know, customer segmentation, measuring churn, uh, the, Hubity, the HubSpot Amity integration, and how it's uh, been able to help you scale your organization and manage your different customer segments. So thanks so much. And again, a big thank you to Paul from Amity, our CEO and founder for hosting us today. Um, just want to remind you that you can get in touch with everybody. Uh, these are Sam's coordinates, and he'd be happy to chat with you, as he mentioned. Really, really helpful stuff. Um, also want to just remind you before we sign off that we've got two more webinars scheduled in our Practical Customer Success Series this fall. The first is coming up on October 7th. We're going to be inviting uh, Kate Leggett, who is a principal analyst at Forrester. She's going to be speaking about smart processes for customer success. And later in the month, we have Jessica Weiss, who is our, the chief client officer at Soapbox. And she'll be talking about predictable customer outcomes. So uh, I want to remind you also that the registration is available on the Amity website at getamity.com. If you just click on the resources, you'll see the registration button there. Uh, before we sign off, you're going to see coming up on the screen just a, a quick survey question where we're just going to ask you for some feedback if you have a moment, please. And if you have any suggestions for future subjects or topics you'd like to see covered here, then we'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, and I think that's it. Just a, once again, a big thank you for making the time to join us. Really appreciate your time and uh, happy, happy to continue the conversation um, either on Twitter or certainly in touch directly with us at Amity. So thanks very much, everybody, and appreciate your feedback if you could just give us that last moment. <laughs>